Good afternoon. We are going to begin today with First Minister's questions. Uh, but before turning to the questions themselves, I'm going to ask the First Minister if she wishes to update us with a short statement on COVID. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I will give a short update on today's figures. Um, 1,656 positive cases were reported yesterday, which is 7.5% of all tests carried out. Uh, the total number of cases, therefore, is now 166,583. As of yesterday, uh, 309,909 people had received their first dose of vaccine. Uh, there are currently 2,003 people in hospital, which is 14 more than yesterday, and 156 people in intensive care, which is six more than yesterday. I very much regret to report that in the past 24 hours, a further 92 deaths were registered of patients who first tested positive over the previous 28 days, and the total number of people uh, who have died under that daily measurement is 5,468. National Records of Scotland has also just published its weekly update that, of course, includes cases where COVID is a suspected or contributory cause of death, even if it hasn't been confirmed through a test. Today's update shows that by last Sunday, the total number of registered deaths linked to COVID under the wider definition was 7,448. 368 of those deaths were registered in the most recent week, which is 23 fewer than in the week before that. 240 of last week's deaths took place in hospital, 97 in care homes, four in a different institutional setting, and 27 uh, occurred at home or in another non-institutional setting. Uh, of course, every one of these deaths is a source of heartbreak uh, to loved ones, and so again, I send my condolences to everybody who is grieving. Uh, the figures that I've reported today demonstrate the seriousness of the situation we continue to face. As a result of the lockdown restrictions, as I reported to Parliament yesterday, uh, case numbers appear to have stabilised and indeed they may even be declining. But as we see again today, they remain too high. Hospital admissions are 30 per cent higher now than at the peak of the first wave last April. And while admissions to intensive care are below the first wave peak, they have almost doubled since the turn of the year. All of this means that our NHS is under severe pressure, and given the number of new cases over the past couple of weeks, that pressure is almost certain to increase. It's therefore vital that we do everything we can to protect our NHS by slowing the spread of the virus and bringing case numbers down. Uh, that's why we confirmed yesterday that lockdown restrictions will remain in place until at least the middle of February, and of course it's why it's so important that all of us continue to comply with them. Put simply, that means we need to stay home. Uh, we should only leave home for essential purposes, such as caring, responsibilities, essential shopping, work that can't be done from home, and essential exercise. Uh, we should not have people from other households in our houses, and we should not go into theirs. Uh, we should all work from home uh, if we possibly can, and on any occasion when we are required to leave home, we should remember facts. Face coverings uh, when doing essential shopping or out for other reasons, avoid places that are busy, clean hands and surfaces, use two metre distancing if uh, you're with someone from another household, and self-isolate and get tested if you have symptoms. Uh, fundamentally, though, the best means of keeping ourselves safe uh, right now is to stay at home as much as possible. So please stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. Thank you very much. Now, the First Minister will take questions. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a supplementary question to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, the First Minister was asked a series of serious questions about why hundreds of thousands of doses of vaccine were not reaching GPs quickly enough. The questions asked were based on the evidence, the testimony of GPs, the testimony of the GP Chair of BMA Scotland, the testimony of Scots over 80s who've heard nothing about when they will be called. In response, we got a bizarre rant that the UK government was throwing a so-called hissy fit about the publication of sensitive future vaccine supply fingers, figures. It was quite the change in tone from the Health Secretary's profuse apology on Friday. The First Minister got what she wanted, which was a cheap headline, but the country didn't get what it needed. The country didn't get what it needed, which was answers. So instead of trying to throw blame onto others, will the First Minister finally explain to the country why the vaccine rollout is lagging behind in Scotland? Why are hundreds of thousands of vaccine doses not reaching GPs and patients quickly enough? First Minister. Um, I will take each of these points in turn because all of them are important. Let me first of all say the vaccination programme is not lagging behind in Scotland. I set out yesterday uh, that we had very deliberately 
uh, focused first on elderly uh, residents in care homes. Why did we do that? Because uh, these are the people, according to the JCVI, who are most vulnerable to becoming ill and dying from COVID. Uh, so we have now vaccinated with the first dose more than 90% of those elderly residents of care homes. Um, and that is what we think will have the biggest and most immediate impact in reducing the death toll uh, from this virus, which is we heard from the figures I reported today, is still uh, far too high. Um, and the reason uh, why the overall numbers, therefore, are lower at this stage because of that focus in care homes is because it takes longer and is more labour intensive to vaccinate in care homes than it is in the community. Interestingly, uh, I've seen some comments this morning uh, attributed to the UK government explaining why the rate, the daily rate of vaccination in England has dropped over the past three days. And the explanation given is that they have decided to focus more this week on catching up in care homes um, and it takes longer. Therefore, the wider programme has slowed down as a result. So we are all grappling with the same issues and we are all working to the same targets. Second point is GP supply. And, you know, I, I look, as the Health Secretary does, at these numbers uh, every single day. I, go to sleep at night with these numbers in my head. I, I wake up in the morning with them in my head, as is right and proper. Uh, AstraZeneca, and I'm talking about AstraZeneca here because that's the uh, vaccine that has been used by our GPs. Uh, the vaccine comes in packs, uh, normally packs of uh, 100 doses, sometimes I understand uh, perhaps of 80 doses. Uh, the supply, the shipment into Scotland has not, uh, until recently, uh, delivered enough packs for all GPs to have a pack of vaccine, remembering, of course, that some uh, GPs will require multiple packs because their patient populations are bigger. Right now, and this figure will be moving all of the time, 75% of GP practices either have supply or are in the process of getting uh, supply. That figure will never be 100% because not every single GP practice, of course, um, is participating in doing vaccinations. In terms of the over 80s, that uh, is now picking up. And as I said yesterday, we reckon now, these are estimates from management information. This uh, information will be published on a weekly basis, uh, but we estimate that now around 20% of over 80s uh, have been vaccinated. And my final point, presiding officer, because these are important issues. You can see from our daily figures uh, that our uh, community vaccination, the vaccination programme overall is ramping up. So if you look at uh, the numbers of vaccines administered on Monday this week, uh, 19,600, uh, that is an increase of 56% on the previous Monday. Interestingly, since comparisons are being made by others, not by me, the increase in England from one Monday to the next uh, was less than 40%. So our rate of increase is actually higher there as we come out of care homes and go into the community. And of course, yesterday, based on the figures I have just reported, 25,327 vaccinations were administered, which is more than Monday. So we are on an increasing trajectory of vaccination as we step up and pick up the pace in the over 80s. And of course, we are working to a target of vaccinating all over 80s uh, and the, uh, everybody in the JCVI groups one and two by the first week in February. Um, so these are the targets we're all working to. I see commentary in the media elsewhere in the UK criticising the pace uh, in England. These, you know, if we, we look at this on a daily basis, we will always find uh, questions to raise and that's right and proper. But the progress of the vaccination programme is strong. My job, the Health Secretary's job, is to uh, ensure that it remains so. Ruth Davison. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Prioritising care homes, as the Scottish Conservatives have always argued we should, doesn't explain why GP surgeries, who should have doses of vaccine sitting in their fridges, don't. The problem here is this insistence from the First Minister that this is all on track. But Health Secretary Jean Freeman said on the 11th of January that all over 80s would have the vaccine by the end of this month, which is the 31st of January. But this morning, the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, rolled back on that commitment, saying instead that I can confidently say to you that the commitments we have given, that the over 80s, for example, will all be vaccinated by the end of the first week of February, is a commitment that will be fulfilled. Repeated just now, by the First Minister. So the Health Secretary's committee to all over 80s being vaccinated by the 31st of January, but the Deputy First Minister has committed to the 7th of February. The First Minister called this vaccination programme a race against COVID, and I agree with her sense of urgency. So why are we already falling behind? First Minister. 
Well, there's, there's three points here, and I'll again take them one by one, because Ruth Davidson is just wrong uh, on all of them, actually. Um, firstly, on care homes. Uh, it is the case that we have been focusing on care homes, uh, rightly so, because that is the, uh, the quickest way to reduce the death toll, because people in care homes are most vulnerable. And how many times over the past year, rightly, have I stood here uh, and been under pressure to answer questions about the, the death toll and the wider toll of this virus in our care homes. So it's right that we have prioritised care homes. Indeed, it is what the JCVI recommended. And it does take longer. This is uh, what uh, I've seen it being reported that uh, the UK government has been saying uh, today um, to explain the dip in the English vaccination rate, uh, daily vaccination rate over the past few days. Uh, the explanation, there has been a big push to finish vaccinating care homes and they take more time, four to six hours each, hence slowing the overall effort. So, you know, it is the case that when you focus in care homes, uh, you don't do as many because it takes longer. But we, unlike the UK government, who I don't know what their figure is now, at the start of the week, I think it was only 50% of care home residents vaccinated. We're now over 90% and therefore able to speed up the rest of the programme. Uh, secondly, on the timing of over 80s, I mean, Ruth Davidson can go back and I think the first time, uh, certainly in this year, uh, I spoke about this was last week in one of my uh, daily updates and I said that we would do over 80s within uh, four weeks, uh, which was always that first week in February. That is not a change. I said it in Parliament again yesterday, the start of February. That is the target date for vaccinating all of the JCVI at groups one and two. Um, and then, of course, we uh, do the groups three and four, and the target date for that is mid-February. Uh, again, I've seen comments from the UK government this morning talking about the rephasing of Pfizer supply, making that uh, a very tight target to meet, but one that we're all determined to do. And lastly, just to repeat, because it uh, possibly didn't get heard uh, by Ruth Davidson the first time I said it, uh, on GP supply, I've set out the the supply constraints we've had so far in terms of getting packs of vaccine to every GP practice, that is speeding up as supply speeds up. And uh, the figure, which again will be moving all the time, will no doubt be different by the end of today than it is right now. 75% of GP practices uh, already have or are in the process of receiving their supply. But again, the figures speak for themselves. From Monday uh, last week to Monday this week, a 56% increase in daily vaccination. From Monday to Tuesday, uh, yesterday, a further increase in the rate of vaccination. So the numbers at the moment speak for themselves. Uh, they're going in the right direction. My job is to make sure they continue to do so. Ruth Davison. But the Health Minister said the end of January, and you cannot get away from that. Now, the First Minister has just said before she sat down there that the figures speak for themselves. And she's right, because the numbers here are pretty straightforward. As the Deputy First Minister has now accepted, the Scottish Government is in receipt of a total of 700,000 doses. But to vaccinate the first of the priority groups, which is care home residents, staff, healthcare workers, and everybody over the age of 80, the Scottish Government, by their own figures, need 560,000 vaccine doses. Again, by their own figures released on the 11th of January, the Scottish Government already had 490,000 doses sitting ready to go a fortnight ago. So the Scottish Government was already sitting on enough stocks to vaccinate 87.5% of their target groups and have been for a fortnight. Today, we hear that 309,909 have actually received the vaccine, which is 55%. And now the delivery date has slipped by a week. Why? Can the First Minister confirm that the stocks from even two weeks ago have reached GPs? First Minister. OK, uh, we'll go through this point by point again, because they're all important points. But again, Ruth Davison's wrong, and, and I'm going to take her on a bit of a, a logic journey on this as well, which yeah, may not take her where she, like she wants to go. But firstly, there is a difference, uh, and those of us who you know, pour over this on a daily basis have to understand these differences between allocation and actual delivery and what we have in hand 
in Scotland, um, and the majority of doses that are in Scotland are actually already in people's arms, and the rest of them will be supplying GPs and other vaccination centres to make sure over the next few days uh, they get into people's arms. That is you know, how a supply chain of anything uh, works. Um, but here's the logic uh, journey. Uh, if Ruth Davidson's whole argument here is, is based on the premise that we've somehow get 700,000 doses. Remember, the UK government are adamant they don't want us to talk about the total number of doses that have been allocated, but let's take, let's take what she's saying. Uh, if that is the case, then that must mean that, uh, given that we're getting our proportionate population-based share, the UK government, uh, for England, have got 7 million doses. They haven't done 7 million vaccinations, so presumably they're also sitting on uh, supplies for no reason in the same way that Ruth Davidson is suggesting we are. That would be the logical conclusion of that argument. It's actually about a complex, really important, but a complex supply chain that everybody is working to make sure gets from the manufacturers to the arms of people across the country as quickly as possible. And we've been successful in making sure uh, that almost all of our most vulnerable care home residents have already got that first dose of vaccine. And finally, uh, on this point about end of January versus the beginning of February, uh, we refine these uh, target dates as we go along based on our developing understanding of supply. So if the Health Secretary did, and I can't recall, but if she did say a few weeks ago, the end of January, we will now know more about supply that have made us, through the modelling we do, say that that's the first few days in February. We've been saying that consistently uh, throughout this year. So there is no change in that. That is what we are working to. That is what we are on track to deliver. And I would suggest that Ruth Davidson perhaps just delves a little bit more into the detail of how all of this works if she wants to continue to have these exchanges. Ruth Davidson. There we have it, Presiding Officer. It's not a slip, it's a refinement. But the problems here have been building for some time. And the Scottish Government continues to stand by and furiously repeat that everything is fine. But GPs and the BMA are sounding the alarm and they are raising the red flags, not to be awkward, but because they and us and everyone wants this vaccination programme to work and time is of the essence. And it is important that the First Minister acknowledges problems and starts to fix them. There are hundreds of thousands of vaccine doses that have gone unused for weeks while GPs are desperate to get their hands on it. We asked last week when all over 80s would get their letter notifying them when they would be vaccinated and we got no answer. We asked yesterday when all GPs would have the supplies they need to accelerate the pace and we got no answer. And I have just asked if even all available stocks from a fortnight ago have been distributed to GPs and I've got no answer. And the simple fact is this isn't good enough. Vaccine isn't getting to GPs as it should. Over 80s are being left waiting when they shouldn't have to and government timescales are already slipping. Sorry, being refined. What action is the First Minister going to take to get this sorted out and get Scotland's vaccination rate back on track? First Minister. Can I say, if Ruth Davidson, in a programme like this, doesn't think it is really important and responsible for governments to refine estimates as knowledge of supplies increases, then I think it will just be another reason why many people across the country are breathing a real sigh of relief that she's not standing here uh, right now. One of the... So one of the things that has changed, and if Ruth Davidson's not aware of this, it's on the front page of the UK Times today with the UK government talking about it. Pfizer has just uh, rephased its supply over the next few months. So over uh, this month and next month, we are going to have fewer doses of Pfizer. We'll have the same overall, but the phasing of that is different. Now, is Ruth Davidson seriously suggesting that in the face of a change like that, a government shouldn't refine its estimates for when it will be able to deliver vaccine into people's arms. Because if she is suggesting that, then I think that is uh, ludicrous, to be perfectly honest about it. Now, let me just answer some of the other points. Letters to over 80s. Uh, many GP practices are not sending letters to over 80s. Do you know why? Because they are phoning them because it's quicker. So that as soon as they have the supplies, they are phoning them to make the quickest appointment that they can. Uh, that happened last week to a, a very close relative of mine in the over 80 category. Got a phone call from a GP practice and within a couple of days had her first dose 
of the vaccine. That is how this has been done, to make sure it is as quickly as possible. So as the supplies come in, and I've set out twice just now uh, what the, the supply constraint has been in getting packs to every GP practice, but I'll repeat again, 75% of GPs have or are in the process of getting uh, that supply, and as soon as they get it, they contact their over 80s to get them in. But I come back to the central numbers here. Uh, our uh, vaccination programme is gathering pace 50% increase in the daily numbers uh, of people vaccinated from last Monday to this Monday, a further increase from Monday to Tuesday this week, having done more than 90% of care home residents, we're picking up pace now in the over 80s. Uh, these are the facts uh, in a very, very complex situation. Um, and I will continue on a daily basis to focus on the detail and actually focus on understanding the detail of this so that we do get it right, not just for the over 80s, but for the over 70s, the over 50s, and as soon as supplies allow us to, for the whole adult population. Thank you. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is nothing more important currently than the rollout of the vaccine. We need to fight this virus, and every drop of the vaccine should find its way into people's arms. Last week, the government published the COVID-19 deployment plan, which allowed for 5% of COVID vaccines to be wasted. So can I ask the First Minister, can she tell us how many doses of vaccine have been wasted since rollout began? First Minister. Um, I think from memory, I set this out in some detail again uh, yesterday. So we make, and not just the Scottish Government, as I understand it, as I've been told by clinical advisors to ours, this is a, a sort of international standard around uh, wasted, wastage assumptions in a programme of this scale. 5% is a planning assumption. What it is there to do is just to make sure we are factoring in the possibility that we hope never happens of some large scale breakdown in the supply chain. You know, a big freezer might malfunction or something else happens that disrupts a significant portion of supply. So it's just to make sure that we've got that cushion should that happen so that if that was to happen, we're still able to vaccinate the numbers of people that we are estimating. There is not 5% wastage in practice. I think I said this yesterday, so far, um, and this again will be a figure that fluctuates, the wastage rate is around 1%. Now, there are huge efforts to get that even lower, but in any vaccination program, and people will understand this, people, human error, people will drop uh, vials and they'll break, or they'll make an error when they're opening them, putting the vaccine into a syringe, or somebody will have got a syringe ready for somebody that then either doesn't turn up for the vaccine or turns up and for some reason they can't be vaccinated. That is just uh, unavoidable uh, to some extent, but the effort is to minimise it. But the 5% is a planning assumption, which I think is sensible, given the things that could go wrong in a programme of this size, but all of us hope never do. Thank you, Billy. Um, I entirely accept the need for planning assumptions when you're planning um, a, a vaccination programme. Um, and I welcome the fact that the programme is doing better than the worst case scenario. But, presiding officer, um, it, wastage at the weekend was at 1.82%. Let me put that in real terms. That's something like 5,000 doses since the rollout began, when people desperately need this vaccine. Are we to believe that this is all burst vials and spillages. On Sunday, the Chief Executive of NHS England, Simon Stevens, said this in response to questions about how surplus vaccine should be used. The guidance from the Chief Medical Officer and from the NHS is if at the end of your vaccination session, you've got a few doses left over, then please have a reserve list of staff and high-risk patients. When Professor Jason Leach was asked about wastage at the COVID committee last week, he was only able to provide an example of what would happen to unused vaccines in a hospital setting. So can I ask the First Minister, has guidance been supplied to GP surgeries and mass vaccination centres to ensure that they have a reserve list of high-risk patients to avoid wasting the vaccine? First Minister. Um, there's guidance published on a whole range of things. I will specifically check uh, the, the state of the guidance on these particular points and we will uh, circulate uh, that. And if there are areas where we need to have more guidance, we will do that. It's in nobody's interest to have uh, doses of this vaccine wasted. Uh, but let me give an example, which actually the, was subject to some criticism yesterday for how a health board was avoiding wasting doses. The Scottish Ambulance Service got doses to vaccinate their frontline paramedics um, and uh, ambulance technicians. 
They had some doses left, so they decided to use them for call handlers non-patient facing. That was subject to some criticism because it's frontline patient facing health workers that are in uh, the, the front line and uh, have highest priorities. Their argument is that that was a pragmatic decision to avoid wasting vaccines. So these decisions are being taken by frontline people all of the time. And often what you find, as was the case with that, is it then gets criticised because it appears to be out with the strict order of priority. Um, it's in nobody's interest to waste vials or doses of vaccines. And, you know, unless somebody is telling me that there's some dastardly you know, secret, unknown, and, and for whatever motivation, attempts on the front line here not to use every possible dose of vaccine, uh, then I am confident that those, because people doing the vaccination programme uh, are experienced. Uh, many of them deliver the flu vaccination programme every single year. Uh, the others, and again, the training programme has been criticised, uh, but part of that is so that people uh, who perhaps don't have experience or recent experience of doing vaccinations know what to do in all of these situations. So often it's the things we do to try to address some of these issues that end up on another day in this chamber being subject to criticism from the same people that are raising these issues right now. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, I am all in favour of pragmatism, which is why I asked about guidance, and I hope the First Minister will check that. Because we know that doctors, vaccinators, cannot work in the dark on these issues, and we cannot risk any doses being thrown away because the guidance from government is either slow or unclear. So I welcome the assurance from the First Minister that she will check about guidance for vaccinators because the First Minister knows the logistical challenges with the Pfizer vaccine and the greater chance of doses being unused. There have been some reports in some health boards that vaccines have been binned because of the change of policy on second doses. So can the First Minister assure the Chamber that any unused vaccines that cannot be used for the priority groups can be provided as second doses for healthcare professionals, something called for by the BMA? And finally, transparency is vital here, presiding officer. So can the First Minister commit to publishing weekly statistics on wastage so that every drop of vaccine goes to saving lives. First Minister. Uh, we're already publishing weekly, we publish daily statistics on the numbers uh, of vaccines administered. We are publishing weekly statistics that are uh, have more detail. I've given a commitment before. We will add detail to that as we go along. There is always a balance to be struck between tying people up in uh, gathering data and reporting data uh, on the one hand and actually doing the job that they're there to do, get vaccine into people's arms on the other hand. But we will uh, be open and transparent about all of that in as much detail as we, we possibly can. Um, Doses of the vaccine will be used uh, to vaccinate people. Uh, that is uh, a focus right now on the first dose of the vaccine to as many people as quickly as possible. And then the second doses will uh, come from that. The family member I referred to earlier on when she went for her first, first dose uh, last week, she was given the date for her second dose. So already that is in the planning and that is part of the, the planning as well around uh, the, the use and the flow of, of doses, particularly if there is going to be a rephasing of the, as there is a rephasing of the Pfizer vaccine already, uh, the, the people who model this for us are having to make sure that we will have enough Pfizer vaccine come the time of those second doses uh, to do that. So that's just one other uh, reason why this is a, a complex uh, exercise, but it's important we get it right. Um, and in terms of uh, doctors or those who carry out vaccinations on the front line, many of them will be highly experienced at doing vaccination and, uh, you know, know the issues that they've got to uh, be aware of, uh, but also that's what the training is for. I've faced questions in recent days, why is the training so bureaucratic? Well, there have been efforts to simplify the training as far as possible, uh, but the reason why the training is important is to make sure that people, particularly those who don't have recent or any experience of carrying out vaccinations, know exactly what they should do in these circumstances. So, you know, I think given the, the scale of this, given uh, the complexity of this and given the importance of this, I think the vaccination programme is going well. I don't say that with an iota of complacency because I understand the vital importance of getting this vaccination uh, to as many people, to the whole adult population, as quickly as possible. That's why it has a, a daily focus from me, from the Health Secretary, from the government as a whole, and we will continue to ensure that is the case. Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey, who joins us remotely. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is good news that people in Scotland are showing strong support for vaccination, but we do still need to take action to get as high a take-up as possible. Scottish Care, for example, have warned that the majority of care homes in Scotland had been approached by anti-vaccination groups, and SAGE have advised that vaccine hesitancy may be particularly high among black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Can the First Minister tell us what the government is doing to prevent the spread of misinformation and conspiracy theories, and specifically what action is taken to support vaccine take-up in marginalised communities? First Minister. Um, we, through a range of uh, different means, will take on uh, myths and, and smears and misinformation about vaccine. We will do that through our advertising and marketing campaigns. We'll do that in very specific ways. So Care Homes, for example, uh, the Chief Medical Officer, uh, the Chief Nursing Officer, the National Clinical Director and the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer are writing directly to care home managers to provide information that they can then disseminate amongst their workforces. There will be webinars with uh, care home workers uh, to make sure legitimate questions can be answered and addressed, but any uh, myths and misinformation uh, can be dealt with as well. Um, and we shouldn't be complacent about this in any group in society, but if we take care home uh, workers just as a group, because that's where the initial concerns have been expressed in just recent days, but we see there, and as I reported yesterday, more than 70% of care home workers have already been vaccinated with the first dose, which suggests there is strong take-up and strong enthusiasm for being vaccinated. But we need to get the uptake of this programme as high as possible to provide as much protection as possible. So we will have to work on an ongoing basis to take on anything that is threatening to hamper that. Uh, that's particularly important in some uh, other groups in uh, ethnic minority populations, for example, in more deprived communities, and we will take forward that work as well. But of course, the focus right now is to make sure these clinical priority groups, wherever people in these groups live, whatever uh, backgrounds they're from, uh, are reached with this vaccine. And that is the work that is ongoing right across the country right now. Patrick Harvey. I think government opposition parties and also the media have a, a shared responsibility uh, to avoid the, the kind of complacency that the First Minister mentions. Of course, one of the biggest proponents globally of dangerous misinformation from COVID to climate and more has been kicked off Twitter and Facebook. Today is being kicked out of the White House and it's time we kicked his toxic brand out of Scotland too. From today, Donald Trump will no longer be the US president and his business activities are under criminal investigation in the US. But his purchases in Scotland have still not been investigated in spite of serious concerns about how they were funded. The Greens have long called for these dodgy deals to be investigated using an unexplained wealth order. Whenever we raise this, the First Minister has told us that it's not her decision to make. Has she seen the legal advice from a senior QC published this week by the campaign group Avaz, making it crystal clear that this power lies with her and her cabinet? Will the First Minister stop hiding behind officials and seek an unexplained wealth order to ensure that Trump's purchases in Scotland are given the scrutiny they urgently need? First Minister. Well, first, I'm sure many of us across uh, the Chamber and across Scotland will be uh, very happy to say cheerio uh, to Donald Trump today. Uh, I think don't haste you back might be the uh, perfect uh, rejoinder to him. And uh, in advance of in advance of the inauguration later on, I'm sure we all want to send our congratulations to soon-to-be President Biden and soon-to-be Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, Kamala Harris in particular today doesn't just become the Vice President, she makes history in a number of different ways and uh, she has my warm congratulations uh, on that. Um, on the issue about legal, I've seen reports of the legal advice Patrick Harvey refers to, I've not read it in detail, I'm happy to do so and come back to him in more detail. Of course the uh, government uh, has its own uh, sources of legal advice um, and what I've said out before is how uh, investigation and decisions around unexplained wealth orders are taken. Uh, these are, are matters uh, that lie uh, with the, the Lord Advocate, but I'm happy to look in more detail at uh, any information that uh, is put to me, and if there are further points I think it is appropriate to make, I will do so. Thank you. Question four, Willie Reddy. The First Minister opposed testing of students until there were big outbreaks in universities. 
She criticised the use of lateral flow tests in Liverpool, claiming they were politically motivated. Then, well after the start of the second wave, she changed her mind. She refused to implement airport testing until months after holidaymakers brought the virus back from abroad. And now she's got the capacity of the PCR tests, but refuses to use most of them. On testing, why does this government always shut the stable door after the horse has bolted? First Minister. Sometimes when Willie Rennie's scripting these questions, if it never crosses his mind, what is my possible motivation for just opposing all these things that if I really thought they could help us beat this virus and save lives, why on earth would I oppose them? Actually, what we do in the Scottish Government, we don't always get it right. I'd be the last to say we do. We make mistakes. We have made mistakes in the course of this. We've tried to learn as we go. But we try to understand the technology, the use of the technology, the pros and cons, and make informed decisions. And why, today of all days, do I think it is important on testing uh, to make that point is that you know, south of the border, not that long ago, before Christmas, there was a, a big announcement made about the rollout of lateral flow testing in schools to every pupil daily lateral flow testing. It's been uh, paused today because it is not practical and it is not sensible to do it in that way. So we try to make sure that we get these things as right as we possibly can. The lateral flow technology, we haven't had lateral flow tests in uh, volumes uh, or indeed at all until relatively recently in the pandemic. Um, and there is still mixed opinion, uh, which is part of the reason the MHRA hasn't given the go ahead to uh, what, what was wanted in England and schools um, about just where and how and how effective they are to use. I think they are an addition to what we've done through P PCR, but we need to continue to consider these things really, really carefully. Um, and, you know, the last point I'd make about this, and I, I hope people would agree, I'm one of the last people that ever stands here and is complacent in any way about the challenge we face right now. We are in a precarious, difficult position. People are living under horrendous restrictions. So uh, the situation in Scotland is not good. But if we are doing everything is wrong, as Willie Rennie keeps trying to suggest, then why is it that, albeit we're in a very difficult position, actually case rates have been almost throughout this pandemic and remain so much lower than they are in the other UK nations and in many other parts of Europe. So we've got lots still to do, lots still to learn. Of course we make mistakes, but sometimes, sometimes, maybe people want to reflect on the fact we don't always get everything wrong. Willie Rennie. God forbid that we ever ask questions of this First Minister when we think she gets it wrong. I mean, the reason why I question her is because the evidence is clear that the First Minister is always behind the curve on the testing. I just read out the list of reasons that she initially opposed and then she supported it only weeks later, but only after there were big outbreaks. And that's when we needed the tests, before the outbreaks. Last week, for example, I proposed deploying that PCR testing capacity at supermarkets, Royal Mail sorting offices and police stations should be rolled out. The front line. Once again, the First Minister said no. As a result, 50,000 tests go unused every single day. Now, since Christmas, the SNP government have failed to use nearly one million of those gold standard PCR tests. That's the phrase they use, gold standard. Now, to be precise, that's 908,585 potential tests wasted. First Minister says she is saving them for a rainy day. Well, First Minister, it's bucketing down outside if she hasn't noticed. We have no idea when schools are going to reopen. Operations in hospitals are being cancelled. Businesses are on their knees and we have been told not to leave our homes. So how bad does it have to get before we get this SNP government to use those tests to detect the virus hiding in our communities? First Minister. Can we clear one thing up at the outset, presiding officer? Just because I disagree with Willie Rennie, just because I think he's downright wrong and doesn't yeah. necessarily always understand the issues that he's asking me about, just because I take issue with the fact that he puts words in my mouth that I've never, ever used, does not mean I don't like or accept getting asked questions. I've probably answered more questions in the course of this pandemic than any leader anywhere else in the world. And 
along the way, I've probably admitted to more mistakes, not necessarily because we've made more mistakes, but because we've been upfront in conceding that we've made mistakes. So, you know, Willie Rennie has to recognise that if he wants to, as he is absolutely right to do, ask these questions. Sometimes if I don't think he's getting it right, I've got a right to say so as well. Now, on the issues, Willie Rennie says we've failed to use all of these PCR tests. These are PCR tests that are there for symptomatic people to get tested when they have symptoms. You know, if you have symptoms, self-isolate and get tested. If we used all of these symptomatic uh, tests, we'd have a prevalence and incident rate right now that was multiple times higher than it is. And that would not be a good thing. That would be a really, really bad thing and a terrible position to be in. And on the more widespread use of testing, we, we evaluate, we take advice, we look at where we can use testing uh, strategically and tactically. And I don't know, maybe Willie Rennie would have preferred us to stand up before Christmas and say, we're going to test every pupil in every school every day, and then have to stand here right now and say, actually, we can't do that because we got that wrong. We've decided to do it in a different way so that when we do launch these testing programmes, we try to get them right and we make sure they contribute overall to having uh, case levels lower than in many other countries and hopefully over the next weeks getting case rates coming down firmly again. Thank you. Question five, John Mason. Uh, thank you. To ask the First Minister what her response is to the announcement that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund will be operated by the UK Government and not by the Scottish Government and the other devolved administrations. First Minister. Well, it's another direct assault on devolution, and I'm disappointed, though not surprised, that the UK Government has decided to take this approach. It definitely raises uh, grave concerns and uncertainty for communities, uh, which of course are compounded, compounded by a lack of detail on the future shape of these funds. Uh, funding of this nature should be decided uh, in this Parliament with all the democratic accountability for that, not by remote Whitehall departments with little understanding of the needs of communities concerned. So I encourage the UK Government to reconsider its position. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the First Minister for that answer. I mean, it does appear that Westminster is seeking to undermine all three devolved governments and the fear is that money will be spent on their political ends and not based on need. Does the First Minister trust Westminster? No. First Minister. Uh, let me think <laughs> about that. Uh, uh, on balance, after careful consideration, no, um, I don't, uh, generally speaking, trust uh, Westminster. Look, this is a serious issue and it is, uh, unfortunately, I think, illustrative of a more uh, general approach by the UK government to undermine this parliament, to undermine devolution and uh, to grab powers and resources away from this parliament. And whatever our differences across this chamber, I really would have hoped that all of us could unite to say no to that kind of approach and maybe uh, we'll yet manage to do so. Uh, the UK government has not consulted with uh, or worked with Scottish ministers uh, sufficiently on the development of the shared prosperity fund, uh, despite us developing clear proposals for a Scottish shared prosperity fund, the UK government kept us at arm's length throughout the process. They've provided no clarity on their objectives, on their delivery plans. They've provided no evidence as to why a clearly devolved policy should no longer be run or administered from Scotland. So it is vital that clarity is given urgently and that we receive our fair share of funding. Uh, as John Mason has highlighted, the losers here, uh, ultimately, whatever the politics of this, whatever the political disagreements, the losers here stand to be Scottish communities, yeah. Scottish people, businesses and organisations. And I think it's more important that the needs and interests of those communities are put first, not undermined and politically, uh, potentially harmed for political reasons. Question six, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to make the training of vaccinators as streamlined as possible. First Minister. I think I may be about to prove a point that I made early in response to uh, Jackie Bailey. Um, our approach to COVID vaccination training aligns, uh, first of all, with that taken by Public Health England uh, and has been informed by discussions with all of the UK nations. Uh, it takes proper account of the existing skills and experience of those uh, being deployed. So for individuals who are experienced active vaccinators, training need only cover the specific characteristics of the COVID vaccines. Uh, training requirements for individuals who might be returning to service after being inactive for a period are informed by a short, short self-assessment, uh, so may take longer. Uh, that said, we recognise the need for a proportionate approach to any uh, induction required over and above vaccination 
education training. Uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, for example, has already streamlined its processes by introducing pre-clinic huddles covering matters that may otherwise have formed part of induction training. And we have written to all NHS boards encouraging them to take similar steps. Brian Riddle. Yeah, can I thank the First Minister for that response. Uh, however, the Chair of the BMA Scotland GP Committee and the British Dental Association Scottish Committee have raised concerns about the process. It has been described as clunky, bureaucratic and containing training modules on subjects that seem to have little relevance to what vaccinators are being asked to do. Patient safety is, of course, paramount, but does the First Minister accept that unnecessary red tape and bureaucratic delays cannot be allowed to deter those applying to become vaccinators? Uh, yes, I, I do agree with that, and I think unnecessary uh, bureaucracy, unnecessary red tape should always uh, be removed. And as I said, Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, is a good example of a health board that's already done that. We're encouraging all health boards uh, to do that. But it is really important that those uh, putting vaccine into the arms of people across the country have appropriate training. And my exchange with Jackie Bailey uh, made the point that some of the issues she was legitimately raising uh, are some of the issues we need to ensure training for so that uh, you know, we can avoid wastage in the programme and those doing the vaccinations know exactly what is required of them. So there is um, a, a tailored approach. Those who will do flu vaccination uh, every year, so our active vaccinators uh, will only need to be trained in the specific characteristics of COVID vaccination. Those who've got less experience or less recent experience need more training than that in order to ensure patient safety, but also to ensure that they know uh, all of the, the do's and don'ts. So it's always a case of getting this balance right, but the approach being taken across uh, the UK is very much aligned and it's there for the right reasons. Thank you. Question number seven, Ruda Grant. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure there is adequate protection for victims of domestic First Minister. Well, I think we all agree, I know we all agree that it's completely unacceptable that for some people home is not uh, the place of safety that it is for most of us. Uh, right throughout the pandemic we have urged anyone at risk of domestic abuse to uh, reach out and get the support that they need. Uh, lockdown restrictions, and it's really important to stress this, do not prevent someone leaving their home if they are escaping domestic abuse and support services have remained open uh, right throughout the pandemic. Police Scotland also continue to treat domestic abuse as a priority and will respond to all calls about domestic abuse. Uh, the government has provided organisations, uh, including Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland, with additional funding to allow them to increase capacity of their services and meet demand. Uh, and we've worked with the UK government on a code word scheme in participating pharmacies to increase access routes uh, to help in the community. Um, and we will continue, of course, uh, to take uh, all appropriate steps to make sure that those who do need support uh, get that support. Rhoda Grant. The First Minister must have been as distressed as I was reading in the Sunday Post about how badly Louise Aitchison was let down by the police both before and after her murder. She'll also be aware that the domestic abuse bill going through the Parliament at the moment is so poorly drafted that it's a real cause for concern. While taking evidence on the bill, the Justice Committee have been told that Police Scotland are not using all the powers now available to them to protect victims of domestic abuse. And I ask what her government is doing to ensure that all existing protections are being used? And can she guarantee that ministers will work constructively with the Justice Committee to make sure that the current bill works? Because it's a national disgrace that anyone reaching out for help is being abandoned and murdered as a result. First Minister. Well, the tragic situation that Rhoda Grant has referred to, uh, of course, is deeply distressing. I think all of us would agree that it is deeply distressing when any victim of domestic abuse, um, for whatever reason, uh, doesn't get the support they need uh, in time to avoid uh, tragic uh, outcomes like that one. And all of us uh, recognise that we need to continually seek to do more to make sure that everybody gets the help they need, first and foremost, that they feel they can reach out for the help they need, and, uh, of course, that they then get that help. And that's why some of the actions I've spoken about already today are so important. In terms of the Domestic Abuse Protection Bill, which, as Rhoda Grant rightly says, is uh, going through Parliament, that will provide police and courts uh, with further powers to protect people at risk. Um, I will uh, very 
uh, willingly pass Rodrigan's comments about the Police Scotland to the Chief Constable. He may want to uh, respond directly. But I know, I know from my conversations with the Chief Constable how seriously he and uh, Police Scotland as an organisation take uh, the responsibility they have to help those who are victims or potential victims of domestic abuse. And at every occasion when the Chief Constable has joined me in, in briefings uh, around COVID, I, I think... I, think on every occasion he has taken the opportunity to stress to any victims of domestic abuse that the police are there for them 24-7 uh, and that they should always call. Uh, but as long as any woman uh, is le losing their life uh, or, or being a victim in any way of domestic abuse, uh, or anybody is uh, for that matter, although it is uh, principally women, uh, then we have more to do. And I think everybody across this parliament, uh, and I know uh, I do, take that very seriously indeed. Thank you. We've got a number of supplementaries. Christine Graham to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The First Minister referred in passing about the production of the Pfizer COVID vaccine uh, possibly being delayed during this month and early February. Uh, constituents have contacted me concerned that this may affect giving them their second dose within the 12 week, when, within the time when they've had their first dose. Could the First Minister perhaps clarify and comment? First Minister. Well, as I said earlier on, and is a matter of public record, Pfizer uh, have uh, rephased their manufacturing, which will result not in the UK getting fewer Pfizer doses, but that being phased over a, a longer period. So that will uh, result in fewer Pfizer doses uh, being available to Scotland and other UK nations over uh, the next couple of months. Uh, the teams who model our vaccine supply against our ability to deliver uh, in these groups are looking carefully at this to make sure that we have properly factored in any impact on the second dose uh, scheduling um, and that is work that will continue to be done and refined as our understanding of supply uh, gets gets clearer um, and it may be uh, it, can't say this with, with any certainty uh, right now, but it may be the case that at some point over the next few weeks, some doses of uh, the Pfizer vaccine have to be held back in order to ensure that second doses can be done uh, within the 12-week the timescale. Uh, but that's, what, uh, that's why when Ruth Davison uh, mocked my reference to refining things earlier on, uh, that's why the need, we, we need to refine all of this literally on a daily basis as uh, supply estimates become clearer, as they change, as they do change, uh, not uh, irregularly, so that we make sure that the, the flow of supply is matching the demand of people that we have to vaccinate. Right now, focus on first vaccination, but as we go through the next few weeks, that also means making sure that we've got the supplies to do second uh, dose vaccinations as well. Thank you, Maurice Corrie, to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Presiding officer, and many of my constituents have been in touch with me expressing their concerns at the pace of the rollout of the corona vaccine, uh, coronavirus vaccine. Figures released last week showed both Greater Glasgow and Clyde and Highland Health Force were below average in terms of first dose coverage. Yesterday, the First Minister said 70% of healthcare workers had received their first dose. Will she commit to publishing those staff figures at a health board level so that we can see and can better understand and track the progress of it. First Minister. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything I said uh, to, to make the point that we're not behind. Uh, we are progressing well and picking up pace in our vaccination programme. I, I've said previously we will uh, continue to uh, provide more detailed uh, breakdowns uh, on a weekly basis of the, the vaccination figures, uh, both by cohort of JCVI uh, priority group, but also geographically as well. We've had a request, a not unreasonable request today, to see if we can include figures on uh, the numbers of dose, doses uh, wasted through unavoidable means. So we will look at all of that. Uh, there is no interest in any uh, part of the government right now in not being uh, transparent about this. This is a collective endeavour. This is important to all of us. It's important to me, first and foremost, as First Minister, to make sure we conduct this vaccination programme with the speed and efficiency uh, that people expect. But, you know, as well as being First Minister, I know people across the chamber might struggle to accept this. I'm a human being with loved ones of my own. I want them to be vaccinated as quickly as possible. All of us want this programme to go well and to go as quickly as possible. Nothing right now is more important to me uh, than making sure that happens. Thank you. Sarah Boyack to be followed by Willie Coffey. First Minister, NUS Scotland published research last week which showed the shocking levels of debt that students experience which have been made worse by the pandemic. 
What support will the Scottish Government offer now and going forward to help students who have lost their jobs and are falling further and further into debt, with a shocking 14 per cent now having to use food banks to survive the pandemic? First Minister. Uh, these are serious issues. We have already provided additional funding to uh, make more hardship uh, funding available to students, and we will continue to discuss with the NUS, universities uh, and others how we can uh, provide uh, more support. This is uh, a really difficult situation <coughs> for students. Like many young people, they have had their education disrupted. Uh, everybody is suffering disruption right now. But students will also uh, be affected because many of the jobs that they do to uh, make money during term time are in sectors that are closed right now. So it's almost a, a double uh, whammy uh, for, for students. So we will continue to do as much as we can to, to help with that. Of course, this is not pandemic uh, specific, but more generally, our position on not uh, charging uh, students tuition fees uh, mean that uh, levels of student debt uh, in Scotland are much lower than they are in other uh, UK nations, but the pressures of the pandemic, of course, uh, are being felt very acutely. So there is a need for us to step up and do as much as we can. Willie Coffey to be followed by Beatrice Wishard. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister if there has been a drop-off in numbers of diagnoses of cancers and other major health issues during the COVID pandemic and how the Scottish Government is encouraging people to come forward? First Minister. Uh, well, from January to June last year, uh, we did see a drop off, for example, 19% uh, fewer cancers being diagnosed compared to previous years. So that uh, has been a concern uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, and of course, that's why we launched the NHS's Open campaign, which people may recall seeing um, in different formats. Uh, and that is to remind people that they should continue to come forward uh, for non-COVID uh, health concerns. Uh, that's been followed by the Right Care, Right Place campaign. It started in December, which uh, incorporates the national door drop uh, that starts this week, uh, providing information on the range of NHS services that are available and includes a reminder uh, for those, for example, with a persistent cough for more than three weeks, uh, that that could be a potential sign of, of lung cancer, so to contact uh, their GP. Um, and I would say to anyone listening, I know many people uh, watch uh, First Minister's questions, daily briefings to get information on COVID, but I take the opportunity to say to anyone listening, uh, you hear me say, if you've got COVID symptoms, uh, self-isolate and get tested. But it's a really, really important message to say to everybody, if you're experiencing any new signs or symptoms that are worrying you, uh, changes in your weight, changes in your, your appetite, lumps uh, that you're concerned about, whatever it might be, then contact your GP practice because they are open and they want to hear from you. Uh, the chances are there'll be nothing seriously wrong with you, but early diagnosis of cancer in particular is absolutely crucial in improving uh, the chance of uh, a patient uh, going on to, to live a long uh, life. So please, the NHS is open and everybody should feel able to use it. Beatrice Wishart to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. People understand that the Scottish Government is following JCVI pri priority recommendations, but are worried about the potential for strict interpretation. A small number of my constituents need to travel to mainland hospitals for appointments, including weekly visits for life-saving cancer treatment, and that necessary travel can leave them more exposed. They are extremely vulnerable, but are not eligible for the vaccine, even though some of them are on the cusp. Can the First Minister assure my constituents that there will be room for clinicians to make common sense decisions on vaccinations in circumstances like these? First Minister. Um, these are important points. I, I would make a, a couple of points in response uh, as briefly as possible. Um, the, the JCVI uh, list is there because these are people who are deemed to be most vulnerable. I think we, we all understand that. I've got huge sympathy for everybody who uh, makes a case for prioritisation uh, above where the JCVI lists say they should be. While we still have uh, limited supplies, though, every time we were to, if we were to agree greater prioritisation for one group, we would have to deprioritise um, another group. But within that general point, those with uh, terminal illnesses, and I know this will be particularly acute in uh, island communities, uh, but people with terminal I had a... a meeting last week with Fred Banning, um, a man who is terminally ill himself, who's campaigning for greater priority for the vaccine and doing a sterling job to make sure that the needs of those uh, 
in his position uh, are understood and, and not overlooked. And, and I've agreed that we'll continue to engage on these matters with the JCVI. Many people uh, who are terminally ill will be in the what's called the clinically extremely vulnerable group. Uh, so they already have priority in those top JCVI uh, lists and uh, will be vaccinated soon, will be in the cohort that are vaccinated uh, by the middle of February. Uh, some will not, um, and therefore I do think there is absolutely a need to allow clinicians uh, to have flexibility, and sometimes to, it's up to a clinician to decide whether somebody should be in that clinical extremely vulnerable group, um, and also to allow a degree, without uh, working against the clinical prioritisation, to allow a degree of flexibility. And I know some of the, the island health boards, not in, uh, exclusively in the way uh, that the member is raising, but more generally are being pragmatic in how they are organising uh, vaccination clinics uh, so that they are not making people travel more than they, they have to do that. And actually, if I look at uh, some of the management information figures, uh, our island health boards uh, are actually doing very well in terms of moving through these groups quickly. But the points about uh, those with particular clinical vulnerability, I think, are well made, and I hope they are being taken account of in the overall decision making. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, two constituents have contacted me concerned that advice provided by North Ayrshire Council. Both households have private tenancies ending in March and advised the local authority of this months ago seeking social housing. In one instance, the elderly owners wish to move back into their property. The advice given, quoting the Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Act 2016, is that the tenant should refuse to move and await eventual eviction, probably post COVID. The tenants have no wish to endure the stress of eviction put themselves and their landlords through additional expense and have an eviction on their record should they seek a private let in future. Does the First Minister agree that this is a ham-fisted way to deal with impending homelessness and that local authorities should be more proactive in assisting tenants rather than await an eviction with all the difficulties that entails? First Minister. Uh, well, I'm disappointed to hear about the anxiety that has clearly been caused to the members' constituents. Um, it is certainly the case that all councils have a duty to assist people who are threatened with homelessness within two months and to prevent homelessness uh, wherever possible. And they also have a duty to provide temporary accommodation to all homeless households. Uh, we've taken further actions, of course, to uh, prevent evictions during the course of the pandemic. If uh, Kenny Gibson is able to provide further details to the housing uh, minister, who's uh, sitting not far away from him, um, I'm sure uh, he will be happy to look into the matter and respond directly in more detail and, if necessary, uh, provide further guidance to local authorities. And Miles Briggs. Presiding Officer Sight, Scotland have announced the proposed closure of Brayside House here in Edinburgh and Jenny's Well in Paisley. The care home currently supports 31 vulnerable, blind and partially sighted residents here in the capital. Um, there's obviously real concern amongst these residents and also their families. Can I ask the First Minister what discussions have taken place uh, specifically with Sight Scotland about a package to save these homes? And if not, will the First Minister investigate um, potential support for the charity? First um, I have not personally had discussions with Site Scotland about this, but the Health Secretary is indicating to me that she is meeting them next week uh, to discuss this. I understand the concerns that will be, uh, be caused uh, by the, the situation that Miles Briggs has outlined. But uh, what I would propose is that the Health Secretary communicates directly with them, perhaps after uh, that meeting with Site Scotland, to give a progress report. Thank you very much, and apologies to, the apologies to the members I couldn't call, but that brings us to an end of First Minister's questions. I'm going to suspend this meeting and we'll resume at 2.30 with a statement on drugs. The meeting is suspended.